morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday Tune. We are back for another season of Talking Tech about mountain bike suspension, nerding out with some very poorly edited videos. My name is Steve. I run Vorsprung Suspension up here in Whistler. And this week's topic, we're going to be talking about rebound damping. Now, rebound damping is generally the most basic adjustment of your damper on either your fork or your shock. So the purpose of the rebound damping, most of you are no doubt familiar with this, is simply to control the rate of extension of the suspension so that it's behaving in a controlled manner. Uh, this makes it safer to ride, gives us more traction, so forth. Basically uh, stops the suspension from just being an uncontrolled spring that bounces us around. Now, there are quite a few different considerations uh, when it comes to the setup of rebound damping. Let's have a quick look at the basics of the mass spring damper theory uh, and how damping typically is considered in this, uh, in this case. So that's the, the mathematical standpoint, not necessarily directly related to the real world just here. So here we have a graph showing uh, your suspension travel. This is zero, top out, bottom out. This is time. So as we're riding along in the direction of time, because we're always moving forward in time, start at our sag point. Uh, we can call it static sag, dynamic sag, however you want to look at it here. So we hit a step. The suspension compresses at a certain rate up until the bike has been lifted up over, over the bump and then begins to extend again. So depending on how slow our rebound damping is, what the damping coefficient is, uh, which is not something that anyone is ever realistically going to know or calculate for themselves, there are several different possible responses. So first of all, if we have very, very little rebound damping, far too little, we end up with something that extends quickly, gets back to the sag point, but keeps going past the sag point, and then will eventually turn around, and so forth. It will oscillate up and down. Now, completely undamped movement with no friction or anything in theory would continue to oscillate basically forever. What we really want to do is stabilize things a bit more than that. So what happens if we go the opposite extreme, run our rebound really slowly, so it's super controlled? Well, following this blue curve here, basically the, re the suspension will extend very slowly until it reaches the sag point. It won't overshoot at all. But if you look at the amount of time taken to get from here to back to the sag point there versus over here, we're taking much longer to get there. That means the suspension is not recovering very quickly. As a result, any other bumps that are encountered before the suspension is back at that dynamic ride height or the static sag point, um, you are already further into your travel to start with. And if that happens again and again, the result is predictable. It packs down into its suspension. From a mathematical standpoint, what is often considered an idealized damping uh, form is what is referred to as critical damping. And critical damping is the amount of damping that allows the suspension or the mass, the spring mass damper system to return to its static point with no overshoot, but at the highest possible rate. So we're looking to get from full compression or whatever displacement it's put to, uh, back to its typical resting point as quickly as possible without overshooting. Now, in practice, this usually doesn't quite work on a mountain bike. And there's a reason for that. It doesn't quite work on anything, really. Uh, there is a reason for that, particularly on mountain bikes. That reason is the rider. When you are standing up on the pedals, the rider's ability to settle the suspension themselves by moving actively uh, is quite high. So as a result, we don't really need to stabilize it quite that much. What we typically end up with instead is something that does overshoot the, uh, the sag point. So when we bounce on the suspension, we'll typically notice this. Um, the suspension will extend past the sag point and then settle again. And that might take one or two uh, oscillations, but depending on how you set your bike up, uh, if there is no overshoot of that sag point, then typically we are in a situation where the suspension is too heavily damped in rebound. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the ultimate goal here? Uh, goal is traction and comfort and control. So what we are really trying to do is maximize uh, the wheel's ability to track the ground and the rider's ability to control where their weight 
sits on the bike. You don't want to be thrown around. The two kind of go hand in hand. Um, now, if we have a quick look at the very basics of what happens over repeated bumps, if we run a very light damping setting. Now this can be, uh, th this is particularly relevant to rebound. Compression does play into it, but we're not gonna go into that here. What tends to happen if we run the rebound uh, super fast is that over repeated bumps, uh, and particularly because most bumps are not purely sinusoidal. We're not just hitting braking bumps that are always the same distance apart, always the same size, and so forth. In reality, uh, the bumps are a bit more random than that, typically. And so what we start to see if the rebound is very fast is that the wheel is able to recover, the suspension is able to recover and return to full ride height very quickly, but it isn't able to maintain a consistent ride height. So we end up getting this motion up and down of the suspension, which averages out in like a, a sine wave of its own. What that ends up meaning is that the center of mass of the rider and the bike get further from the ground, closer to the ground, further from the ground, and so forth, uh, in a less predictable and less controlled way than what we would like. Conversely, if we go with very slow rebound, what tends to happen is that because this, this wheel is not able to recover quickly enough, the suspension is not able to recover quickly enough and return to full ride height, the thing just packs down and down and down into its travel. Now, in practice, uh, because the rebound damping coefficients that we use are always higher than compression, um, and they have to be, this, some degree of this is always going to happen if your bike is even remotely stable. Now, how much it happens uh, really varies. If you're on your rebound super slow, uh, what you'll find is that the suspension packs down, the motion gets less and less as you get further into the travel. And as a result, the wheel doesn't follow the ground very well. Although the center of mass height of the rider is more stable, what we're generally trying to do is find the balance somewhere between one extreme, where the thing is packing down a really long way into its travel and leaving like very little positive travel left, and something that is bouncing us around. Now, to maximize traction, keep the wheel on the ground uh, and reduce the variation in the tire contact patch normal load, which is basically the definition of uh, mechanical traction, we need to strike the balance here. So what we need to do, first of all, is make sure that the wheel can get down to the ground and at the same time make sure that the bike and the rider are not being bounced away from the ground. So it's very interesting considering, uh, and you really have to experiment with this for yourself, it's very interesting considering that while faster rebound does let your wheel return to the ground faster, it also lets your bike and your body get bounced around more. Now, it doesn't matter if your wheel is able to return and track the ground faster, if your center of mass, if your whole bike, your frame has you know, moved away from the ground by, let's say, 30 centimeters. No one has that much suspension travel anyway. So if you've been bounced a foot in the air, then at that point, fast rebound has actually hindered you rather than helped you. Likewise, the opposite extreme, uh, if we slow it down uh, purely for the sake of stability, then we start to compromise the bike's ability to track. However, optimum traction, even though it would seem sort of intuitive initially uh, that it comes with fast rebound, um, doesn't come with completely uncontrolled rebound or very fast rebound. There is always a sweet spot for that. Now, this does vary according to your terrain, how you ride, the way you run your tires, all the rest of it. There are a lot of variables, and this is why I say you have to experiment. There are also other factors to consider, like the fact that not every rider prioritizes traction over all else. If you want something that is a super lively feeling bike, uh, then you might want something that's closer to this. It might just feel more fun to you. On the racetrack, it might not be faster, but if that's what you're looking for, you know, that's your prerogative. So regardless of what adjusters you have, whether that be high and low speed uh, rebound or you know, beginning and ending stroke as they were termed on the Vivids, these principles are applicable to every aspect of your rebound setup. Anyway guys, that's it for this week's Tuesday Tune. Uh, thank you for watching. 
Uh, comments, feedback, always welcome. And we will see you again next week.